Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody and welcome to the final lecture of the second week of uh, great experiments in psychology. Uh, this lecture uh, week, this lecture week was on cognitive and social psychology and the lectures on discussions on cognitive and social psychology, the great experiments in uh, studies in cognitive and social psychology will not end if we do not talk about Milgram. Stanley Milgram is one of the major figures in the studies uh, on social psychology and especially because his research created a surge of interest in obedience and this was followed up by a large number of studies later on and this uh, study not only uh, was it important uh, because of the things that it revealed but it was also important because it brought in the uh, in the issue of ethics in psychological research so mm, uh, today uh, we are going to discuss about stanley milgram and his study on obedience so he his study started with uh, a very interesting uh, phenomena. So, he uh, or a very interesting background in 1961 uh, when he was going to start the study, there were two major events that were happening and around the same time later on uh, researchers across the world linked them together and saw that uh, they could be fused and unified and to form an explanation for the model of evil that dominated popular and scientific uh, thinking for more than half a century. So, what was happening? In 1961, uh, there was something going on at Jerusalem District Court and at the same time around in the psychology laboratory at Yale University. So, uh, basically uh, in uh, the Jerusalem court, Adolf Eichmann, uh, he was the head of Reich main security office of sub department during World War II. That is, he was a uh, very uh, close confidant of Adolf Hitler was being tried in court in Jerusalem. So, basically the um, this is post world war as you can understand Adolf Eichmann one of the major uh, proponents uh, or major resp uh, people individuals responsible for deportation and sending the Jews large number of Jews to thousands and thousands of Jews to the gas chambers. Uh, he basically dealt with evacuation and uh, he was uh, he after the world war two he had um, fled to Argentina and he was well settled there. And then uh, the, the Israeli intelligence uh, society that is Mossad, they identified him and they kidnapped and got him back to Jerusalem, to Israel. And in 1961, he was being tried for his uh, major, uh, for his wide war crimes, crimes against humanity and crimes against the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And on April 19, uh, 11th April 1961, the trial began and Adolf Eichmann was seen by the public for the first time. So, it created a huge uproar. If you ask uh, people uh, at your home who were uh, present during that time, uh, you will see that, that uh, or if you just go through the newspaper and documents during that time, you will see there was a huge uproar across the world. Uh, primarily because Adolf Eichmann had been identified and he was being tried and the other one was that he was um, the way the Mossad actually captured him uh, from Argentina and uh, identified captured him and brought him back to, to Israel. So, um, but uh, the other uproar that uh, came about was when I Adolf Eichmann was first seen by the media. So, what was expected? most of the people across the world were expecting somebody who would be a staunch stern um, German Nazi soldier like uh, as we as we as our images are uh, from our um, uh, fr from what we see in the movies and at that point in time people who do remember uh, German leaders. So, uh, strangely Eichmann was nothing of the kind instead of a strutting arrogant Nazi officer 
he uh, was uh, he he was very nondescript he was hunched he was an insignificant balding man and he was very thin also so uh, that this created quite a surprise for most of the people who were present in court that day and for people across the world who were seeing it through media and uh, he basically sat uh, behind a bulletproof um, glass uh, wall and he was uh, busy taking notes of whatever was of the court's proceedings. Now, in that court was present another very uh, famous German philosopher and historian named Hannah Arendt. And Arendt uh, later wrote a book on Eichmann in Jerusalem and <coughs> she introduced the phrase penalty of evil. Now, uh, he, uh, I will come to the idea of Eichmann uh, later, uh, of Arendt later, but uh, she is the first one who uh, actually uh, pro uh, proposed the idea that uh, these people uh, who commit uh, acts of crime are not always a participant in the idea of developing the crime. But most of the time, as Arendt proposed, uh, Eichmann and people like him were moved less by great hatreds than by the petty desire to do a task well and to please their superiors. Indeed, they concentrated so much on the task, this is what Arendt thought, that they forgot most about their consequences. Eichmann had no motives at all. He merely never realized what he was doing. This is Arendt's idea. Of course, there was an uproar about Arendt's idea also because uh, the Jews who had suffered or the, whose families had suffered did not agree with this view. And this idea that ordinary people can commit extraordinary acts of evil through sheer inattention, this idea was absolutely unbelievable and it was uh, extremely controversial. But it this idea gradually found more evidence through research studies. So, um, now on one hand we have uh, Eichmann being produced in court and he was being tried. On the other hand, there was Stanley Milgram and his study on obedience. Now, why have I mentioned about Adolf Eichmann? Basically, because Stanley Milgram uh, sitting in uh, Yale uni University was also thinking on the lines of uh, um, of obedience and aggression and uh, how the uh, why the Germans behaved the way they did. Now, just uh, we'll have to just look into Milgram's background a little. Milgram was born to in 1933, the year Hitler came to power. He was born born to Jewish uh, parents, actually uh, from East Europe. And uh, the parents and he, he, they all followed the war very closely, uh, trying to understand how uh, the Jews were being treated across the world, especially in um, Europe. And this background actually impacted his research and his initial research, Milgram's initial research was on conformity. He tried to see that whether nations, especially Germany, did they differ in their degree of conformity as compared to the other nations. Then gradually, he shifted his uh, research to studies on obedience. And uh, just about the time when Eichmann's uh, uh, trial was closed, that is around 14 August 1961, Eichmann's trial was closed. A week earlier, that 7th August 1961, Stanley Milgram began his obedience experiments at Yale University. So, you see how the geopolitical conditions of the world also influence the psychology movement. We have talked about this in the previous uh, week, basically when we are talking about the development of psychology uh, through the developments in physics and physiology. And um, now, we are talking about the social conditions. So, the world wars had major impact, especially the second world war had major impact in the approach in or in the research arena of the psychologists. And this study just shows, see how the researchers are also thinking. Milgram's background influenced the way uh, his research was taking progress. And the Milgram in this study, especially in during the study of obedience, he started with the hypothesis that Germans are different. And it is actually known as Germans are different hypothesis. There are several studies that have been done with this. And mm, Milgram was originally actually trying to test this by hypothesis. And um, 
this was actually germans are different hypothesis this was actually proposed by uh, the jews poles and others uh, the, um, this was proposed by historians because of their destruction political destruction of jews poles and others during the 30s and 40s and uh, this hypothesis maintains that hitler could not have had put his uh, plans into action unless there were a cooperation of thousands of others and these thousands of others had to believe in these evil views that hitler had so germans were different and the germans have a basic character defect namely a readiness to obey without question regardless of acts demanded by the authority figure and it is this readiness to obey which provided hitler with the cooperation he needed so what uh, so basically this is a second part of the um, uh, hypothesis uh, or the second postulate uh, was what milgram was trying to test so that these uh, through his experiments on obedience so milgram was actually trying to show that yes the germans were indeed different they would definitely obey they had a readiness to obey without question they would uh, regardless of no matter what acts uh, was demanded by the authority figure and this readiness actually helped hitler to um, uh, put so much of um, violence into place okay so uh, he actually milkman actually planned this uh, plan to do this experiment in germany but uh, before that he had a trial run in america at yale university and um, this was basically a dummy run and uh, later on it was seen that the trip to germany was unnecessary because the gadh that's the german the different hypothesis that failed now what happened so mm, on the assumption that milgram expected to collect data in germany that would support the germans are different hypothesis the 1963 study by implication predicted that there would be very low levels of obedience when american participants were instructed to deliver increasingly intense electric shocks the highest shock level being life threatening to a fellow participant so milgram just to show that the germans are different he was going to test that and he was planning to do that in germany so he tried out dummy run in america and there it uh, this was his hypothesis that the americans uh, would uh, deliver uh, increasingly uh, uh, would be would have very low levels of obedience and uh, they would not deliver uh, a life threatening shock to a fellow participant now to test this he uh, used uh, the remote victim experiment and later on the voice feedback experiment so um, the, what did the so it was implied that the american participants would uh, show very low levels of exp, uh, obedience and they would not uh, give shock so as we can well understand this hypothesis and what milgram asked uh, was 14 psychology students to predict what would happen if 100 participants um, uh, in the remote victim experiment we'll discuss about the experiment but uh, as was obvious the psychology students they thought that very few uh, participants would continue up to the highest shock level and 40 psychiatrists also predicted that less than 1% would administer the highest voltage okay the highest voltage mind you would be around 450 volts now let's see what this experiment was about so uh, this experiment was about delivering shocks to uh, individual to a, another fellow participant who was uh, in a learning experiment uh, where if the uh, fellow participant made an error then he would be given a shock now this study now come coming to the experimental design it was a it was rather a controlled observation than an experiment and uh, observation was used for collecting data and uh, tape recorders photographs and later on um, even film recordings of the proceedings were made and along with that uh, post experimental interviews were conducted and a lot of qualitative and quantitative data was uh, collected along with this uh, the sample size was 40 males aged between 20 and 50 years and from different educational and occupational backgrounds so the answered advertisements which were sent by post or appeared in the local newspapers asking for volunteers for a study of memory and learning so they were uh, to participate in a memory and learning experiment to be conducted at yale university and people uh, this was put up 
uh, on the newspapers and uh, people who were who volunteered uh, were called and they would be paid uh, around 4.5 dollars um, per uh, hour and when the participants arrived at the Yale University they met uh, Jack Williams and supposedly he was the experiment mind you so this is a scripted stage okay so Jack Williams here uh, was the experimenter and they were also introduced to a Mr. Wallace who was another participant of the study Mr. Wallace was a stooge and you already know what a stooge is a stooge, a stooge is an experimenter's confidant where he is helping out the proceedings of an experiment. He is most of the times uh, present in the experimental situation acting as a catalyst to drive the uh, way of the experiment. So, um, most uh, and the participant who is actually the subject in this case is uh, generally not aware of the uh, stooge uh, as an experimenter's confidant. Okay, he, he thinks that the stooge is also a fellow participant. <coughs> And Mr. Wallace uh, was introduced as another participant. He was actually a tr stooge. He was a very well behaved and mild mannered and likable individual and all the other participants generally uh, liked him. Okay. Now, um, the participant and Mr. Wallace were both told that the experiment was concerned with the effects of punishment on learning and one of them was to be the teacher and the other was to be the learner. So, their roles were determined by each drawing a piece of paper from a hat. It was randomly done, but actually it was not random. So, every time it was planned in such a way that every time the each participant, uh, so there were 40 male participants as we saw. So, each participant would actually be the teacher and Mr. Wallace would happen to be the learner. So, now they after that they all went into the adjoining room where Mr. Wallace was strapped into an electric chair apparatus. So, the experimenter explained that the straps were to prevent excessive movement when the learner was being shocked and electrodes were attached to the learner's wrist and electrode paste applied to show that the, to avoid bliss and burns. So, what is being done? The participant hmm, here in this case who is going to be the teacher is already being given uh, information that this is going to be painful when the shock is being given and the electrodes were attached to the shock generator situated next door. So, the teacher and experimenter then moved to the into the room. So, the teacher is uh, the, uh, uh, the participant and the experimenter in this case is uh, Mr. Jack Williams and they moved to the next room and uh, where the generator was kept and the teacher in this case the actually the participant is given a 45 volt shock to convince him that it was real and he was conducting an experiment where real shock would be given to the uh, to Mr. Wallace to the subject. Now, um, the, <coughs> the strange thing is that this was the only shock that was actually delivered throughout the experiment. So, the um, uh, subject or in this case the learner that is Mr. Wallace who was sitting inside the room never got a shock at all, but the it, this was done to make the participant believe that the shock was going to be given and so that is why he also got a taste of the shock. So, that was of only 45 volts. So, uh, the generator and the switches and everything was shown and um, this was uh, shown that the shock would start with 15 volts and it would go up uh, to 450 volts maximum and with uh, the experiment if there was an error then there would be a, uh, a shock would be given and that would be actually uh, by uh, uh, increment of 15 volts. So, um, then they were also sh the su subject uh, in this case the participant who is going to be the trainer uh, was shown that what was slight shock, what was moderate shock, what was strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, intense to extreme shock, danger or severe shock all that was shown to him. Okay. So, after that uh, the what was the technique that was to be followed here Mr. Wallace who was the learner was already uh, strapped and kept in the um, uh, electric chair and 
um, outside the the participant or the teacher here was in a separate setting. So, he could not see the subject who was being shocked that is Mr. Wallace who is being shocked, but he could hear the sound okay. and um, the work was that he would have to read out a series of word pairs like blue girl, nice day, fat neck and after uh, one pair uh, there would be uh, the f uh, then the first one of the pair uh, would be told and it would be followed by five words of which the original had to be identified. The learner who was learning these pairs had to choose the correct response to the stimulus word by pressing one of the four switches which turned on a light on a plan panel in the generator room. So, that is where the um, experimenter and the teacher would be hmm. and the teacher would actually then if there was an error he would give a if, if there was a mistake then he would press the shock button. So, before delivering each shock the teacher had to announce the voltage level. Now, uh, what would happen is if there were too many errors and it uh, crossed 300 Mr. Wallace would pound loudly on the wall at 300 volts and at 315 volts he would st after 315 volts he would stop pounding and give no further answers. Now, if he did not respond the teacher was to take it as an error and then he would be also gi be giving further shocks till 450 volts. Now, do you think that uh, people would uh, be willing to give such shocks knowing that uh, once they have tasted a 45 volt shock do you think a person would go up to 10 times more to give 450 volt shock. Now, let us see what happens and here uh, the experimenter also would nudge the subject to uh, give the shock several times it they would say like please continue please go on the experimenter re experiment requires that he continue it is absolutely essential that he continue you have no other choice you must go on. But uh, the prods or the nudges would always be in very uh, uh, in a firm tone, but not very impolite and they were there was also something special to nudge the to urge the subject to continue and that would be like uh, that is uh, the teacher to continue in this case where the shocks may be painful, but there is no permanent tissue damage. So, please go on. Now, what was expected? What do you think the uh, participants would do? Let us see what they did. So, these are the results you can go through it later, but every participant shocked up to at least 300 volts. Now, that is shocking. 5 refused to go beyond 300, 4 more gave one further shock before refusing. So, they went up to 315 volts, 2 broke off at 330, 330 volts and 1 each at 345, 360 and 375 volts. This makes a total of 14 defined particip participants. So, out of mind you 40 participants, 26 participants or that 65 percent were obedient participants they went all the way up to 450 volts. Many did so under extreme stress, some expressed reluctance to shock beyond 300 volts, showing many of the fears that the defiant participants displayed. At the end of the experiment, many heaved sighs of relief, mopped their brows, some shook their heads in regret, but some had remained calm throughout. So, what does that tell you? That Many of the Americans too or if you could conduct this experiment anywhere in the world, many people would remain calm throughout and still go on administering the shock. See now these uh, participants had no idea that Mr. Wallace or the subject who was sitting inside the, the electric room was actually not being shocked. So, they knew they had tasted the 45 degree uh, 45 volt shock and they knew or they felt that this was uh, being given 10 times more, but still 26 people actually went up till 450 volts. Then all the participants knew that how much would actually cross the danger zone. So, they went beyond the danger zone to give the shock to administer the shock. 
So what did Milgram uh, conclude from this study? So <coughs> He, he said that despite having learned from childhood that it is morally wrong to hurt other people against their will, 65 percent of this cross section of an ordinary American town abandoned this principle in following the instructions of an authority figure who had no special powers to enforce his commands. They would not have been punished or suffered any material loss had they disobeyed. See, they were actually paid the money before they became a part of the experiment and they were also told that you know th it was initially signed that they could um, sign off from the experiment anytime they wanted but still they went on with their tendency to obey the extraordinary tension and emotional strain caused by the procedure was present in both the defiant as well as the obedient participants so that also tells us a lot that you know it's not that innate uh, nature to actually harm others, but it is also uh, this tension uh, that was present in the people who said no and who did not say no. So they, though they, these people they obeyed, uh, most of them were very disturbed by it, and that was one of the reasons why this experiment had to be stopped. So ethically, uh, this was not right. Subsequent research uh, by uh, Mogadam and Turnbull showed that uh, you know this type of behavior this type of obedience and this type of aggressive behavior is seen violent behavior is seen in a uh, um, situation where the where the environmental conditions are adverse and mogadam and turnbull uh, studied uh, ike a traditional hunter gatherer people now living in uganda near the kenya border social life there involves extreme selfishness and total concern with personal survival to such an extent that parents deprive their children of food and children even, even refuse water to aged parents. The explanation they say seems to lie in the terrible conditions in which they live. Formerly hunter gatherers roaming freely in search of game, they were forced by modernization and national boundaries to live in a confined territory with very limited natural resources. Life became a fierce struggle for survival to the extent that they seem to have completely abandoned the value we associate with human social life. So what they suggested was that in such extreme conditions similar to those in Nazi concentration camps, many of the values we normally associate with human nature, they disappeared and these underline the power of the situation and these shape behavior. And Mugadam, to quote him, he said that our behavior, it seems, is much more dependent on the social context than the dominant Western model of self-contained individualism assumes. Now, this uh, also, so several research continued after Milgram's study. And Milgram's study, uh, as I mentioned, that one of the major constraints was the ethical issue where uh, Milgram had actually not uh, informed the participants about the nature of the experiment and um, as in you know they were not told that this individual was not being shocked and the emotional distress that it um, created in the participants who several of them broke off as I mentioned. So uh, this uh, created an uproar about the type of uh, psychological research uh, how it should be, uh, you know, uh, whether it should be permitted or not. But uh, Milgram, as he said, that you know, in the uh, the ob obedience, the obedience domain could not be explored if the individuals were actually the participants were actually aware of the uh, of, of the idea of the experiment. So they had to be debriefed later. You could not do such an experiment uh, without. Uh, with taking them into confidence. I mean, if you wish to see obedience, then how would you actually inform them before and then see whether they were being obedient or not. So Milgram's uh, research may have left the impression that situational uh, pressures completely outweigh personality factors in determining obedience. And I was following orders was, of course, one of the major uh, defense that was made by the Nazi war criminals during the Nuremberg trials. But uh, this also uh, showed, uh, you know, the of course, uh, legally the they were the plea of not guilty 
on grounds of obedience was duly rejected and this suggested that there is more to obedience than the agentic, agent, agentic state. So, basically um, this research with this uh, also began several other uh, researches and um, Zimbardo carried out his uh, prison experiments uh, following this uh, where he studied the aggressive behavior and of course, when we are talking of um, social psychology, we in no way can we miss out Milgram's and Zimbardo's study. But um, unfortunately, we had only five uh, lectures, so uh, <laughs> which I had to share between uh, cognitive and social psychology. So, these are the major areas uh, that I felt uh, need to be discussed when we try to establish psychology as a science. And, um, maybe sometime later if we have an opportunity to discuss several other major studies that were brought about by the geopolitical conditions of the time also that actually addressed uh, the contemporary issues uh, maybe we will come up with that later okay thank you